Everybody doing church? Thoroughly depressed at this point? All right, here we go. Hey, uh, get your Bibles. If, if you don't have one, there's one right in front of you or your device or however you look it up. It's all good. Uh, we, as we wrap up our, our study of the Ten Commandments, we're actually going to be um, in Philippians today. It'll make more sense in a little while. Okay, Philippians is, is way over to the right. It's in the New Testament, almost to the end. Um, if you're new to Bible study, just remember, uh, God eats popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So if you find yourself in any of those, then, uh, you, or General Electric Power Company, either way. But that's how pastors memorize where the Bible the, the books of the Bible are, so maybe that'll help. But as you're kind of looking up that, hopefully you're there, or you can find it in a second, so put your Bibles down, because we're going to review, Let's, last time I'm going to make you do this, we're going to review the Ten Commandments, and you've already memorized them if you've been with us uh, in this six-week series, but some people are new, that you know, hadn't been here in a while, or, or you, you're here for the last one, and, and so we don't want to leave you out. So get your fingers out, let's go, everybody's got to play along, don't make me call you out, grown men, I know you think you're cool, you're like, I ain't doing it, you're not that cool, get over yourself, get your fingers out, here we go. All right, one finger, make sure it's the right one, you're in church, remember that, okay, there's one God, all right? There's one God. You shall know no other gods before you. Number two, second commandment, make like scissors, all right? Cut out the idols. No idols. Number three, it looks like a W. Watch your mouth. Do not use the Lord's name in vain, all right? Number four, uh, there's typically four Sundays in a month, so remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Number five, parents, your favorite one. Yes, sir. Obey your father and mother, all right? <clears throat> Number six, my favorite one, thou shalt not murder. Now remember, don't put your thumb up, that'd be seven, and seven could lead to six, but that's, that's the next one. Okay, seven is thou shalt not commit adultery, all right, they kind of go back here, all right, explain that one to your kids later, that'd be great. Or if your kids are here, just show them last week's uh, sermon, they'll love that. All right, the eighth one, this is where we're picking up today. Uh, in some countries, if you steal, they'll cut off your pinky, all right, so thou shalt not steal. Aha, I'm lying, I do have a pinky, see there it is, bing, don't lie, so thou shalt not lie. And then number ten, reach your hands forward like this, and thou shalt not covet, all right. Give yourselves a hand. Good job. You know the Ten Commandments. So where we are today is on 8, 9, and 10, and we're going we're gonna to use them or talk about them all together, and that's, you know, you don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. Now, these are not suggestions from God. This is not like, a, hey, here's a couple of ideas that can improve the way you live. These are commandments from God. He is saying, don't. Don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. The problem is, as I'm putting together messages and I begin to think through, like, what, what are the hurdles that I have to get, get over? One of the problems is I don't know anybody that admits they're a thief and they're a liar, and we, some of us will, will say that we covet, but nobody I know has ever come into my office and said, you know what my problem is, Pastor? I'm a liar. No, nobody thinks they're a liar. Nobody thinks they're a thief. They don't. And a part of the reason I think... Um, that, that we don't think we steal is because we live in such an entitled culture that we think everything belongs to us already. So I'm just kind of getting what's rightfully mine, and we'll try to justify in our minds why stealing for us is okay, and, and you still don't believe me until you sit down to, to file your taxes and watch what you and I begin to do to try to convince ourselves uh, well, I could just lie on this form, and I know I'm probably supposed to pay that, but I'm not going to pay that, and I didn't vote for the guy anyway, and I didn't make up that rule, and I don't believe in this part of the taxation system, so uh, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. And, and again, let me just tell you, let me make it real simple. If you take something that's not yours, you're a thief. You're a thief. And, and I can tell you when it was just really revealed to me what a, what a crooked thief that I am, remember, remember when, um, when you really began to get your mind around the internet a little bit, and you were like, I can get free music. This is great. Remember Napster when that first came out? And you're like, I can type in any song and get any song from any time for free. I don't have to buy the CD. Uh, I can get it all free. And then somebody came along and said, you know, that's stealing. And you're like, that's not stealing. It's sharing. Remember right here it says file sharing. We're just sharing. And my mom said that sharing is for caring. And I'm just trying to do what she said. No, you're a thief. For some of you, us, we, we rob our employer. This week, you were robbing your employer. Yeah. Those hours that you spent on Facebook while you were at work, and again, you justify it in your mind. You're like, well, they don't pay me enough anyway, and I'm a, I, I contribute to this company, and they get all the money, and I'm whatever. If you're taking stuff that's not yours, or let me, let me really thin out the crowd. Guess what God says? God says that some of you today will rob him, that you will rob God financially. And you're like, dude, I ain't never robbed God. I've never gone back to the giving boxes and cracked one open and took a little lunch money out and be like, ha-ha, all right? In fact, some of you are like, I, I feel like God robbed me once. I thought the giving kiosk was an ATM, and I was trying to get some money out. and was like, thank you for your contribution. Like, yeah, I think you just robbed me. <laughs> but, but God says that when we come to the house of worship and we don't put him first in our finances, that we rob God. 
And, and you're thinking, no, 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 I'm generous. I give 6%. Look, you can't give God anything. First and foremost, do you realize that? If you think you give God something, then you've got it all backwards. You can't give someone something that has everything. He is, it's just on loan from him, and you bring it back. It's like when your kids give you a Christmas present. Yeah, how did that work out, right? They took money from you to go buy some junk that you would never buy for yourself. You've never opened a Christmas gift from your child, and it worked out good for you. You think, great, I just spent $20 on me for something I don't even like. That's what it's like when your children try to give you stuff. So, so we don't think we're thieves, but listen, we're thieves. I mean, thieves. And so the Bible says don't. And then lying? Listen, you're a liar and I'm a liar. We're liars. We are liars. And nobody admits it. I've literally had people tell me, no, 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 I'm not a liar. I just struggle with the truth. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I was like, I know I got this water on me, but I'm not wet. That just doesn't make any sense. And, and let's just be honest, okay? I, and again, I know you want to lie. Because we all struggle with this, all right? We're, we're liars. I lie about stuff that doesn't even matter. I do. Gretchen calls me on the phone. Are you on your way home? I sure am. And I'm sitting at my desk, no intentions of leaving in the next 30 minutes. Yeah, on my way. Not on my way. And I know you lie too. You tell a story and, and you change some of the details. And some of you have been lying so long about the stories that you believe your lies the, the way it actually happened. You do and I do. But we are liars. You know why we lie? You know why we lie? Because we're so concerned about what other people think about us. We are so concerned. We seek the approval of man instead of the applause of heaven. And so we lie. And we either we lie about us. We lie about other people. And, and I'm telling you, folks, I lie about you. When I go speak at conferences, you should hear the stuff I say about you. All right? I mean, whatever I need to say about you so that whoever I'm talking to thinks I'm a great pastor. Sometimes I talk about how awesome you are, and sometimes I talk about how horrible you are. Whatever. I lie about you so that people listening to me will go, wow, that guy is good. You do it too. Some of you lied like 30 minutes ago. Because you walked in the door, and somebody, you hadn't seen them since last Sunday, and they go, how are you doing? And you went, oh, I'm blessed. And you had the worst, more, you almost killed your children, okay? <laughs> you're not sure if you're going to go home married. And you walked in this place, and went, oh, I'm just blessed, praise God, to be in this house. <laughs> Liars! And God says, don't covet, don't covet. And, and people are like, no, 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 I don't covet. All right, just, do you watch HTTP? Then you covet that's the whole point of the whole network is to look at stuff that you don't have and want that stuff. I mean, the whole thing is about how to get better stuff that you don't really need. And so I hate the whole network. And I lean into Gretchen. I'm like, Gretchen, why are you watching this show? It's just about ripping out appliances that work to replace them with appliances that work. I don't understand. I think it's rooted in sin and it's evil. It's coveting. And then she says, well, what about your hunting shows? Okay. Don't you just want to hunt where they hunt and shoot where they shoot? And I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We ain't talking about my sin. Let's get back to the, the speck in your eye real quick, okay? It's coveting. And we compare, I'm telling you, we compare ourselves. Every reality show, most of what we're entertained with is about comparison. And let, let me tell you what happens when you compare yourself to, to the people around you. You always lose. It's a lose-lose proposition. First and foremost, you always compare what you know about yourself to what you don't know about them. You compare their highlight reel to your B-roll. And you think your life is kind of bleh, and their life is awesome. And their life's not that awesome. It's just not. And here's why it's lose-lose. Because sometimes we compare ourselves to people, and we feel kind of puffed up. We're like, hey, I ain't perfect, but look at this jackknife. I mean, I'm better than them. That's called pride. C.S. Lewis says it's the mother of all sins. Or you compare yourself to somebody else, and you feel beaten down and condemned and unworthy. And the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it is always lose, lose. And so God says, don't do any of those. Now, here's why I want to deal with all three of them together. It's because the root of stealing and lying and coveting, I think, is really one thing. It's just a lack of true contentment. Because if you were truly content with what you had, you wouldn't have to steal anything. If you were truly content with who you are, you don't have to change any of the details because you're okay with who you are, and if you were truly content in your circumstances and God's plan for your life, you don't have to be jealous of his plan for anybody else's life. So think about contentment for a second. Just think for a minute what comes to mind when you think about, I mean, true, like, contentment to the bones. One of the things I think about is, is 
this doesn't happen always, but sometimes when I take my family out to the beach, there are those moments like, you know, the next few weeks where it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and we get out to the beach, and I just plant my chair down, and I face the ocean, and I don't move, okay? And I've got the four Martins there, and then Gretchen's right here next to me, and she moves her chair about every six minutes to make sure she's lined up perfectly with the sun, so, you know, it's an even bake at all angles, all right? That's important to her. So eventually, we're not even looking at each other anymore, you know? She's over there. The ocean's over here, whatever. And then my kids are finally old enough where I'm not afraid they're going to drown every four seconds. You know what I mean? And so they're running around in those moments where my son is being nice to my daughter and, you know, the son's beaming down on G just right. I've got a cold drink in my hand and Zach Brown on the radio. You know what I'm talking about? And I just think all is well. Ah, that is just contentment. Except the only problem with that, it's totally circumstantial. Totally circumstantial. Because as soon as some idiot from Ohio next to me is feeding a seagull, I want to kill him. You know what I mean? <laughs> People, give me a break, all right? Right? Now, if you're from Ohio, don't feed the seagulls. Okay, so <laughs> it could change in a second. So it's not really, it's really about comfort more than contentment. And what, the reason I want to look at, at the book of Philippians is because I want to look at the Apostle Paul because he personifies contentment in a way that, that it's even hard to describe. And we're going to look at the whole book of Philippians today, all right, in our time together. Chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Because contentment's not just about your circumstances. Because true contentment would be sitting on the beach and even, you know, if, the, if the, my iPod died and I ran out of the cold drink and the storm came and a shark got one of the kids, that there would still be, now I'm sure you'd have all kind of emotion around that, but there would still be what the Bible says, a peace that transcends understanding and guards my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That's contentment. And so, let's go to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. I want to talk about, talk about the root behind stealing, lying, and coveting is a, is a lack of true contentment. And again, you'll see it in Philippians like crazy. A guy named Paul writes it, and here's what he says in chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And what had happened was he's in prison. And the reason he's in prison is not because of his disobedience for breaking the law. He's in prison for his obedience to Christ. That everywhere Paul goes, Paul has one message. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who, it doesn't matter who he's talking to, when he's talking to him. He, even while he's on trial, he's leading the people that were trying to arrest him to Christ. That's what he does. And so it's... He's found himself in prison. And so what he's saying is, is that, hey, listen, me being in prison, it's cool. And here's why it's cool, because it's really served to advance the gospel. Now, the American in us, you know what we want to do? As soon as we hear this, we want to rise up and be like, whoa, 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 Paul, that's not fair. That's not fair. Look, I know a lawyer, and we should sue. And Paul's like, man, you can save the phone call. You don't have to call a lawyer. I'm okay with this. Why? Because, because he's got like this... He's got this contentment. It's just hard to even get our minds around. Verse 13. So it has, come, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So Paul would say, hey, look, it's my story for his glory. So regardless of the circumstances in which I find myself, it's cool, man, because, because God is using my life for his glory. And let me just tell you, Today, in my current circumstances, this is an easy sermon for me to preach. You know why? Because I'm the most blessed man alive. I mean, with my wife and my two healthy, beautiful kids and this church. Do you guys realize I'm clocked in right now? This is what I do. Y'all came for free. I got paid to be here today. You understand what I'm saying? The greatest church I've ever been a part of with the greatest bunch of people I've ever gotten to know. I mean, I feel like the most blessed man alive. So it's easy for me to talk about being content, but what if the whole thing fell apart? If all the circumstances went wrong? What I've got to do is make sure I find my contentment in Jesus, not in the blessing. So if the blessings go away, the contentment does not go away. And so Paul says, Paul says, hey, listen, God's using it for his name, verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's like, Man, some people are preaching better because I'm in prison. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, 
not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Listen, to which if, if we were sitting there with Paul, you'd be like, seriously, you rejoice? You mean people are trying to hurt you in prison? Brothers, Christians, because they're the worst at attacking other Christians. And there's some guys that are trying to defame your name and to try to try to ruin your reputation and trying to hurt you in prison here, and you rejoice in that? Come on, don't you want to talk just a little bit of junk about them? I mean, Paul, you are writing the Bible. So if you could just write their name in the text for thousands of years, churches all over the world would hate these guys just like you hate them. Don't you want to say something? And he's like, no, nah, man, I'm good. I'm good. I don't even really care about their motives as long as the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out. And he says, in that, I rejoice. You know who rejoices when the circumstances aren't going their way? People that aren't ruled by their circumstances, but they're, they're truly content. He says it again. Yes, and I will rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And then one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, verse 21. With all that in mind, sitting in a prison cell, here's what he says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, can you imagine that kind of freedom? Can you imagine to have the sort of freedom? I mean, the true, like, supernatural, transcendent kind of contentment to be able to say, regardless of the circumstances, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Do you realize, can you, can you imagine how frustrating this must be for the people that are trying to punish Paul? I mean, they come to him and say, Paul, you've got to quit preaching about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all right? I mean, give people, like, you know, tips to be better husbands and wives, but you cannot keep talking about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul's like, you do whatever you got to do, bro, but I cannot help talking about this Savior of mine that changed my life. And they say to him, all right, well, we're going to beat you with sticks if you don't shut up. And he's like, beat on, bro. Because I consider it joy to partner in the suffering of Jesus Christ that I might know his resurrection better. And there they are with a stick, like, boom. And he's like, thank you, I'm more like Jesus. Like, bro, okay, well then, we're going to put you in prison. Well, give me a hymnal because I'm going to sing praises to God and I'm going to lead your jailers to Christ. Well, then we're going to kill you. Hey, to die is gain. We'll leave you alive. To live is Christ. Ah, what do you do with that? <laughs> what do you do with this kind of man? That regardless of his circumstances, nothing can faze him. I mean, don't you want that? I want that. I want that kind of freedom. It's like this. I don't, I've got this word picture in my mind. I don't know if it makes sense, but I'm going to try. All right. It, it, it's almost like every single one of us had these handles, like these handles all over us. And they're different kinds of handles. And, and this world is like the walking dead zombies, always just trying to grab onto us and get control of us. All right, And some of us have handles of like greed or pride or sex or whatever it is. Just all kinds of different things that this world tends to be able to get its claws into us. You know, grab onto those handles. And the Apostle Paul, the guy saying to live as Christ, to die as gain, he's, it's like all his handles fell off. And this world is trying to get a hold of him and get a grip on him. But he's too stinking slippery because he's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there are no handles for anything for the enemy to grab onto. And there's freedom there. There's so much freedom there. What can you do to a man like this? Because he has this contentment that just transcends understanding. So that's chapter 1. Chapter 2 of Philippians. And chapter 2 starts out this way. Paul's talking about the unity of the believers together. And he, and he says a part of the way that we have unity is that you should consider others better than yourselves. And that you should look not only at your own interests but also at the interests of others. And right at the point where you push back and you be like, yeah, how am I going to do that? Then he ramps it up in chapter 2, and he says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And what that means is, even though Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, he never played the God card. He never got to a long line and was like, oh, Can you all move out of the way? I'm God. I'm going to the front. He never did that, okay? That he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but, but he made himself nothing, literally emptied himself, which is usually the opposite of us, because most of us are full of ourselves, and he empties himself, he dresses himself as a servant, and he's obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that's what Paul sets up in chapter 2, and then with all of that in mind, 
that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, that, that he emptied himself, he was obedient, that he went to the cross. Then you get one of my favorite verses. It's chapter 2, verse 14. So therefore, since Jesus did all that, and if we're in Christ, we're supposed to have the same attitude, then do all things without grumbling or disputing. The NIV says it this way. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Why? Because you don't have something to complain about? No, you got plenty to complain about, all right? But compared, if, if our attitude is like Jesus and he stepped out of heaven and he came to earth and he died on a cross because of that and he lives in you, therefore, you do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And you, you do everything without complaining or arguing. So the next time that you feel like you want to complain, which what will be, like in an hour from now, when you're trying to get out of the parking lot, right? And you're like, do they not know that we have somewhere to be? Okay. Then you, whatever it is, whatever the thing is that you want to complain about, see if it falls under the everything category. And if it does, the Bible says, don't. Okay? You know who doesn't complain or argue? People that are content. When you're content, you don't complain or argue. And then look what happens when you don't complain or argue. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you should you shine as lights in the world. You want to change this world? You want to make a difference in Jacksonville? I mean, you want to shine like a star in a crooked and depraved generation? What do you do? Do you pray more? Do you lift your hands higher in the singing? Do you memorize the songs so you can close your eyes? Do you attend church more? Do you start a nonprofit organization? Do you, what do you do? You know what the Bible says? Don't complain and argue. You will be so radically different in this crooked and depraved generation that your whole world will look at you and go, what is wrong with you? How come you don't complain and argue? And you go, because I am perfectly content. And people, people will be like, yeah. They, they won't even have a category for you at work tomorrow. You see, and you know who does not complain or argue? Here's who doesn't complain or argue. People that are content, people that are content. Have you ever met these kind of people in real life, face to face? You know one of the reasons I want every single one of you to go on a mission trip? Do you think it's because Africa needs you? No, nah, they're doing fine without you. You need them. Because let me tell you what's happened to me about 150 times. I get on some plane to go be the savior somewhere and be awesome and take all that I know to help these poor people around the world that need me. And I show up on their doorstep, and they don't have a door, they're just a little hole in their mud house, and I meet these families. And from my perspective, materially, they have nothing, nothing. A bunch of kids and a mom, and there's no dad anymore because he died of AIDS or something, and there's just this mom. And I say, what do you need? And a hundred times they've looked back to me just full eyes and say, I got Jesus. What else could I need? And I am strangely jealous of their contentment and their dirt floor. You know why? Because they've got contentment. Contentment. And you and I drive around in our new cars and our awesome clothes. And are you content? Come on, it's crazy, isn't it? Chapter, uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1 and follow, like 1 through 6. Paul is going to start listing uh, like his resume. He's going to list out all of his accomplishments, religious accomplishments, moral accomplishments, financial accomplishments, and he's like the who's who. I mean, if Paul was here and he were to go through his accomplishments of what he has done, you'd think, man, this guy's kind of a big deal. And then right after he lets us know what a big deal he is, and you get to verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So Paul would say, look, this isn't a category. I, you know, I'm not just like a Christian, but, but I love Jesus and he loves me. And he is my personal savior. And he has totally, radically transformed my whole life and the way I see life. And for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And remember, those are good things and bad things. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, I've told you this before. The Greek word here translated rubbish is skubilon. Say skubilon. And if you look it up like a Bible dictionary, it will say slang term for animal dung. Now, look, this is Jacksonville. There's not a person in this room that uses the word rubbish, all right, unless you're British. I mean, if you're walking out in your yard, you step in something, you're like, oh, no, I've got rubbish on my converse. No. What do you say? I know what you say. I ain't saying it in here, but it's bull scubulon. That's what you say. You're like, oh, scubulon. That's what you say. Paul was trying to be shocking here, all right? 
He's like, you know all that stuff that's become so important to you? Your status and material things and even relationships. I mean, whatever it is that this world has to offer compared to the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he does to set you free and give you a, a peace that transcends, that, that transcends all understanding. Compared to knowing Jesus, all of this stuff is crap. Crap. And there's religious crap, and there's financial crap, and there's moral crap, and there's good crap, and there's bad crap, and it's all crap. And I want to say crap enough to really get everybody worked up, okay? Are you there? Are you there so we can move on? And here's why, because that's what he was saying in the book. It's scubulon, compared to knowing Jesus. And so that's why he says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as scubulon, in order that I may gain Christ, verse 9, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This is very important as we're wrapping up our Ten Commandments series. Paul's saying, my righteousness does not come because I have the ability to keep the Ten Commandments. In fact, there has been a lot of you in this room right now and the reason you tapped out of church for a decade was because you were trying to produce a righteousness in and of yourself because that's what your old preacher told you had to do. That you can't drink or smoke or chew and go with girls who do. And dang it, those are your favorite girls. And so you were just devastated and exhausted. And so the whole point is not that you can obey the Ten Commandments on your own, that you can't produce a, right, a righteousness on your own. It is slavery to try to produce your own righteousness. And it's a burden you can't bear. And that's why he says, but my righteousness is from Christ, from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul, aren't you bummed that you're in prison? Hey man, if this is what it takes to help me abide in Christ and be more like Christ, it is worth it. It is worth it worth it. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. You get this? You know what Paul's saying here? Paul would like the church of 1122. Because Paul would want to be a part of a movement for all people. Not good people, not perfect people, not religious people, but all people. Which, by the way, if you think you have arrived, then please don't come to our church and screw it up for the rest of us, okay? And if you think, you know what, I got a lot of issues, you're going to feel right at home here at the church of 1122. I promise you. Because, look, I, I'm the chief sinner in the room. I am. If you knew what happened up in here, you would not let me be the preacher, okay? I promise. But, but, the, but the doctrine of sanctification, sanctification just means to become more and more like Jesus over time. But just sanctification starts with, I'm not there yet. That I have not arrived yet. And so Paul says, hey, I haven't obtained it, and I'm not perfect yet, but here's what I do. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. So Paul's going to start saying, so how did I arrive in this place? How can I be in prison and say to live as Christ and to die as gain? How can I say that I consider everything I've ever accomplished in my whole world scubilon compared to knowing Jesus? Here's the one thing I do. Here's how I can Here's how the handles for this world have fallen off. Here's how I can enjoy God's blessings in this world without being consumed by them. Here's what I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In other words, I change my focus. That's what he's saying. Do you know that your life is going to go where you're looking? It just is. Whatever you focus on, that's where your life is going. All of you that have been training, teaching your teenagers how to drive, you know this, right? Because your teenagers learning how to drive, and they're like, is that the road? And they just take you in the ditch. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You look forward, I'll read the road signs. The same thing's true in our life. And here's what Paul's saying. He's like, listen, I'm forgetting what lies behind, and, I, and I'm straining forward to li what lies ahead. And he's going to explain it more in 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Part of the reason you're not content is you get your eyes focused on the wrong thing. Because we get focused down here, and Paul's like, I'm not, I don't do that. I, I want to focus on the upward call of Christ Jesus. Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, anything, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have 
attained. That's past tense. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Past tense. You know what that means? That if you're in Christ, that it's a done deal. That you are a done deal. You know what you, know what you have attained in Christ? You're a full heir of the Most High God. You have full sonship to God Almighty. And this applies to sons and daughters, but you have sonship because the first son in this culture had access to everything that was the father's. And that's what you have. So while I love to tell you every week that you're a wretched, black-hearted sinner, that's not totally true. If you're in Christ, that's the past. And the new you, you're more than a conqueror. You are victorious. That you are an adopted son of God into the family of God. And all that is Christ's is yours and it's already done in God's economy that you're a full heir and so he says so just act like that act like that you want contentment that you start actually acting like what's actually happened in your world that you're a full heir verse 17 brothers join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those walking according to the example you have in us verse 18 for many of whom I have often told you and now I'll tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. So, so Paul's saying, hey, I'm talking about contentment here, and I want you to look at two different examples. So look at me and the brothers that have our eyes fixed on Christ, and then you look at those walking as enemies of Christ, people in this world. And they're on two different paths that have two different predictable destinations. Verse 19, he's like, those folks that are enemies of Christ, here's what they do. Verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. That's it. You know what else that's known as? The American dream. It just is. Listen, I am pro-America. God bless America. It was by his grace that I was born in America, and it's by his sovereignty I was born in the South. So praise God for that too, all right? <laughs> you ever hear anybody saying, when we retire, we're moving up north? No, they all moved down here with us, all right? So it's a fact. And listen, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, man, pursue life and protect life. It is a good and godly pursuit. Pursue liberty because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the pursuit of happiness is a life in the pit of hell. It, it, it just is. To spend your life trying to manage your circumstances so that you can be happy, I am telling you, that ends in destruction, that your God is your belly. You know what that means? Your belly says, I'm hungry, feed me. And you feed it. And when you get finished eating, you think you're done eating. And then like an hour, or then the dessert menu comes. Oh, maybe I wasn't done all the way. And so you chase after everything this world has to offer, and it satisfies for a minute, and it is a trick. It is a trick. In fact, you know what will reveal your, your dissatisfaction and, and your discontentment more than anything else? is your success. It's your success. I mean, how many of you have succeeded? Or you, you said, you said, man, as soon as I fill in the blank, then, then I'll be fine. As soon as I get the promotion, as soon as I get to go back home with the kids, as soon as I get that car, as soon as they get those clothes, as soon as the kids are out of diapers, oh, then it'll be easy. <laughs> as soon as they can, you know, as soon as, as soon as they go to school, whatever it is, I'm telling you, it's like a revolving door, and it never fully and finally satisfies. You know what we call that around here? We call it the cul-de-sac of stupidity. You know why? Because here's what we do. I mean, every single one of us have a propensity to do this. Hmm, man, I've got more stuff than I ever thought I would have, and the stuff that I have is not satisfying me. What should I do? Oh, I know, more stuff. Take another lap in the cul-de-sac of stupidity. Did you realize at some point in your life, the clothes that you were wearing made you feel like a better man or a better woman? I mean, you were standing in a dressing room, and you put on that shirt, and you were like, man, I look so good in this. And then it won't be long. You know what's going to happen to that shirt you're wearing right now? Okay? You're going to die. And your kids are going to hold up the shirt and be like, what in the heck was dad wearing? Right? Look at these mom jeans. I can't believe mom wore mom jeans. And then your clothes that we're wearing right now, we're going to sell it in our thrift store for $3. Do you understand that? Somebody you don't even know or like is going to be wearing your clothes right now. And yet... And yet, when you look at the way we live our lives, sometimes we live it like it's the most important thing in this world. Or your golf clubs, I mean, you've got to have those kind of gloves. I'm telling you, one day, some guy you don't even know ain't even going to be playing very well with your clubs. It's true. It's just true. And some of us think, oh, man, 
once I, okay, once I just get my kitchen renovated, then I will be fully and finally satisfied. And so you take appliances at work and you throw them away and you put silver ones in because how could you possibly eat food that was refrigerated in a yellow refrigerator? You can't. It's got to be in a silver refrigerator. And look, and I'm not anti that stuff. You come to my house, we got granite countertops because you have to, right? Because you got to be able to hit your granite, your countertops with a sledgehammer and nothing happened. You have to. Who could cut chicken on anything but granite? And so you got to get that. And, and you just realize that one day, one day, my kids, JP and Reagan, are going to come back home one day and make fun of our silver appliances. They're going to be like, look at mom and dad. They are so old. That you got to have like a lime green refrigerator. That's what all the cool people have, right? I'm telling you. And I'm, get you some stuff, enjoy stuff, nothing wrong with stuff, until you begin to put your hope there. Until you think that it's actually going to do something for your soul. When we do that, I can tell you what happens is your end is destruction, your God is your belly, you glory in your shame because your mind is set on earthly things. Verse 20, but if you're in Christ, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, that's how I do it. I don't act like I'm going to live in this world forever because I'm not going to live in this world forever. That I'm a citizen of another kingdom. And so what a lot of us do, listen to me, we, we put all of our hope and all of our trust in the earthly things of this world, and I promise you they will let you down. The advertisement that every company puts on television is to try to promise you something that it cannot deliver on. It can't. I, can re- I remember in the 80s when this Coke commercial came out and they're holding hands across the whole earth. You remember this? And they're singing a Coca-Cola song. And, and, and the, the message is, Coca- I mean, this, this sugar water from Atlanta is going to save the world. Guess what? It didn't. It didn't. They didn't even believe it. They switched to new Coke. That's how dumb they were. Okay, you understand? It's all false promises. And for us to live like we're going to spend forever here, it's just foolishness. It would be like putting hardwood floors in your hotel room. That you move in and you check into your hotel room and you call down the front desk and be like, hey, can you get on the the phone with Lowe's and and I'm going to put hardwood floors in here. And they'd be like, "Um, sir, you're checking out in four days. Yeah, I know, but I just want to be nice while I'm here. Everybody would look at you and be like, why would you invest so much in something so temporary? I can promise you, from heaven's perspective, your stay here on earth is a lot shorter compared to eternity than your four days in the Holiday Inn Express. It just is. Because the reality is this, that we're all just got our little time on this rock ball that's spinning around. And in our solar system, it is not that big. And under every single one of us, there is a trap door. And, and at some point, every person in the room, that trap door hits and you fall off that rock. And you fall either into the everlasting loving arms of a heavenly father or you fall to an eternal existence without him now how important is the stuff of this world and so paul says see for us for christians for people that have surrendered to jesus our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the lord jesus christ go to chapter four see he hits it in every single chapter in chapter four beginning in verse 11 he says this he says not that i'm speaking of being in need for i have learned in whatever situation that i'm to be content How would you like to learn that? How would you like to learn in whatever situation, whether you've got plenty or you're in need, whether your your circumstances are awesome and you're blessed like crazy, or your life is falling apart, how would you like to have a, a contentment that you can't even understand? That people would look at you and say, yeah, I know you've got emotion around this and, and, and you're dealing with it, but man, there is like a peace that transcends understanding. That's what Paul says. Paul says, I have learned. I've learned that whatever situation I'm in, I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So Paul would lean in and say, hey, hey, come here, come here. Shh, don't tell anybody, but I got a secret. Yeah. You know how I can say to live as Christ and to die as gain? And you know how I can say that everything that I've accomplished in this world is like scubulon compared to the surpassing knowledge of Jesus? You know how I can do this? You know how I can say that I'm pressing on towards the upward call and I'm forgetting what is behind and I'm straining towards what is there? Come here, lean in. Shh, I got a secret. It's a secret. I learned it. It wasn't natural, but I learned it. And here's the secret. And it's Philippians 4.13. And all you Gator fans think Tebow wrote that verse so he can score touchdowns. That is not what that verse has to do with, all right? I'm glad the bro put Bible verses on his face so people would meet Jesus, okay? But 
It has nothing to do with like, hey, if you put your mind to it, God will get behind your dreams and help you do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Wrong answer. What he's saying is he's talking about true contentment. And he says, the secret of contentment is this. Verse 13. I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me. What all things? I can do everything. I can be brought high. I can be blessed. I can be successful. Or I can have nothing. I can be beaten. I can be thrown in prison. That really doesn't matter. What matters is that I have Jesus. That's what matters. If you grew up, if you grew up in church and you had like a Sunday night service and it was like a traditional, traditional church, sometimes your service would get crazy and y'all would get out of the hymnal and you'd sing a chorus. And there was this chorus at First Baptist Dillon sometimes that they would sing when I would occasionally go. And, and the preacher would sing it. And I'm not going to sing because that's just, you got to know your giftings. And so it, it would start out this way. Maybe you've heard it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look long in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Um, Tim Keller, he's a pastor up in uh, New York. He's like the smartest pastor alive right now. And he, uh, he wrote a book uh, called Counterfeit Gods. And the whole point of the book is that we're just idol factories and we're going to worship something. And, and every one of us in, in our heart, we have a throne and something is going to sit on the throne of our heart. And so what you have to do when you're enamored with the things of this world is you cannot kill or crush an idol. You can only replace it. And that something, something will sit on the throne of your heart. And as I'm reading this book, I'm thinking Indiana Jones and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And you remember the opening scene? You remember he's in the tomb and there's that big rock and there's the little golden idol statue there and it's sitting on that little podium and he knows that he can't just remove the idol because the whole place will cave in on him. And so he can't just remove the idol but he's got to replace the idol with something that will take its place. Something's got to sit on that podium. The truth is something will sit on the throne of your heart. And right now if it's anything but Jesus, it's lying to you. And so what you do is you got to take that idol off and replace it with Jesus. Paul's saying that's the secret. The secret of being content in any and every situation is that it's not about your situation. But that Jesus is Lord of your situation. And therefore, if that is true, okay, if that is true, then guess what? I don't have to steal. I don't have to steal because Jesus is more than enough. And I trust that he's good and he wants good for me. And so I don't have to take what's not mine because if he wanted me to have it, he'd give it to me. And here's where the good news is really good. And even when I do steal, he's still more than enough. And I don't have to lie. And I don't have to lie. And the reason that I don't have to lie is because I am eternally approved by Jesus. So if you don't, have, if you don't approve of me, that's okay because he eternally approves of me. And so I don't have to make stuff up so that you'll like me more. And even when I do, and even when I lie in my lying, he still approves of me because of what he did at the cross. And I don't have to compare, and you don't have to compare. And I, you know why? Because I trust God's plan for me. I trust God's plan for me. And even when I do compare myself to you, and even when I do covet you, even essentially what I'm saying is, God, I really want your plan for them. Instead of your plan for me, even when I do that, his plan for me is still good, and he still doesn't give up on me. So here's the point. Stealing, lying, and coveting. It's practical atheism. That's what it is. Stealing, lying, and coveting. When we do this, it's practical atheism. And what I mean is, I bet most of you aren't atheists, okay? If you are, you know, you should probably figure out a better way to spend your Sunday. If you, I'm glad you're here, though. I really hope you meet Jesus. Surrender your life to him. It, I promise. But when we... So we might say we believe in God, but when we, when we steal and when we lie and when we covet, it's practical atheism. We're not actually trusting God. We're acting like he's not there. And so what it means, what it reveals is that we don't trust God's provision, God's approval, and God's plan. And so the way this plays out is that when we realize that Jesus is the secret of that true everlasting contentment, then the way it plays out in our lives is, look, we don't steal, we're generous. And the reason that we're generous is not just because it's the right thing to do. The reason that we're generous is because, because God is first in our life. And God loved us first, and he went first, and he sent his best and his son, Jesus Christ. And so we respond by bringing our first and our best to God in, in being overly generous because he's first in our life. 
And the reason we don't lie, the reason that we're honest, is not because honesty is the best policy. Actually, sometimes it's not. You can get more stuff the more you lie. I mean, really. So it's not about just being a better person. The reason that we speak the truth is because truth is a who and not a what. And if you're in Christ, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if the truth lives in here, then it comes out of your mouth. And the reason that we don't compare and covet is because, is because we trust his plan for us. That we believe that the cross fully and finally proves that God is for us and he's not against us. And that he has a purpose and a plan for our life and it's not to harm us, but it's to give us a hope and a future. And that doesn't necessarily mean cash and prizes. It means your hope and future is in Christ alone. And so contentment, Contentment's wanting what God wants for us. And circumstances do not bring contentment. Contentment is not a hand issue. It is a heart issue. Because I could fill up your hands and you may or may not be content. I could take everything out of your hands. You may or, not be, may or may not be content. Contentment is a heart issue all the way. So here's how Jim Elliott says. This is a guy that gave his life for the gospel on the mission field. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. C.S. Lewis, my favorite author, he says this, if we, find, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. So as we wrap up the Ten Commandments, I want you to grab on to a couple things, okay? Because our tendency, okay, our tendency is, is to see the Ten Commandments and think, man, I better try harder. I got to quit lying so much. And you're really just lying to yourself. I got to quit, quit checking Facebook at work. He said that was stealing. I didn't realize I'm a thief. And I got to quit watching HCD, HDTV because it's, it's Satan, okay? And I just got to try harder. That's not the point. The point of the Ten Commandments, first and foremost, is this, that God is a good dad. He's a good dad, and he loves his kids enough to discipline them, and he loves his kids enough to give us the gift of the law, which was both provision and protection. And even more important than this, it was the gift of the law to diagnose you and I that we need help. We cannot do it on our own. We've said that the, the law in the Old Testament, the law is both a map and a mirror. It's a map to show us how to live well, and it's a mirror to realize that we're lost and we're not going to be found on our own. And that Jesus, the lawgiver, came to this earth to be the perfect law keeper, to pay the price for a bunch of lawbreakers so that we could be made his righteousness. And I think, I think, one of the things that we've got to fundamentally change, because if we get this one, I think it changes everything. So we've got to understand that, listen, that God is a good dad. He's a good dad, and he loves, he really loves you. I know you know that theologically, but I bet if I were to ask you, what does God think about you right now? I think most of you think that he lives with this low-grade frustration in his children. I really do. And you know why? Because if you're a parent of little kids, you live with a low-grade frustration of your children. It's just true, is it not? I think that we think if we took a snapshot of God's face right now, he's probably kind of like, mm. you know, like he's kind of putting it. Like one day we're going to be awesome when we get to heaven and he glorifies us and perfects us. But right now he's kind of like a little bit aggravated with us because he gave us this law and we keep screwing it up every day. And he's like, oh, come on, really? And here's why I think that. Like this weekend, you know, it was a really busy weekend for us. And, uh, and my son, JP, had his first baseball game. And so I come rushing in the house. I'm like, all right, bud, you got to get ready for your baseball game. All right, your uniform is in your room. Go put it on. And it's, you know, socks and baseball pants and this belt that you have to have a degree to get through all the loops and stuff, this special baseball belt. And then his, his you know, you got to have the right jersey and the right hat because we've got some options and cleats and all of that. And I'm like, go put it on right now. Yes, sir. And he goes. And then I go do some things, assuming he's going to, do what I told him to do because he's a kid and I'm the parent and that's how it's supposed to work it said so in the Bible so then five minutes later I go and I open the door and he's got one sock on and an Xbox controller <laughs> and I do what you do pray no I lose my mind <laughs> are you kidding me are you you cannot be serious right and I'm just going crazy and I'm looking at him I mean with this face, all right, this, just, and I asked these semi-rhetorical questions, what were you thinking, really, 
what are you think? Did you hear me tell you what to do? Yes, sir. And you knew how to do it. Yes, sir. Then why are you not doing what I told you to do? And standing there with one sock and an Xbox controller, he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and I think that's what we think God thinks about us. Didn't you know what to do? I wrote it down, gave it to you. It's just 10 steps. Why don't you just do it? And we're standing there with one sock and an Xbox controller like, uh. Let me tell you the difference. God's a perfect father. And he does not look at you with frustration. But when he looks at you, because Christ was the perfect law keeper, and he paid the price for all of us lawbreakers, whoever surrenders our life to Christ and puts our faith in him, we get the righteousness of Christ. So every time God looks at you, he sees the perfection, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you were to take a snapshot of God's face right now and the way he sees you, what he looks like when he's looking at you, he does not look like a frustrated parent. His face shines and he smiles on his kids. And when you know that, you know that there's contentment in that. Because Jesus is more than enough. And, and I've got to be careful about how I say this, okay? Because God is for God, first and foremost. But he's also for us. That he's about his glory, but his glory flows out of him in love on us. And he's content in us. <laughs> like he loves you just the way you are. And he knew exactly who you were when he paid for you and he adopted you into, into his family. And he's a good dad, so he's not done with you. He's not done with you. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to keep wearing you out to make it more and more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. But right now, in this moment, he looks at you with a smile on his face. You don't believe me? Let me read you some Bible verses. Our same hero here, Moses, he gets together all the preachers. That we're, it's in Numbers, so we're skipping ahead a little bit. And in Numbers chapter 6, he, God tells Moses, he says, Moses, go to, go to all the priests. And you tell them, whenever you gather my children together, this is what I want you to say to my children. I want you to say this. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you. See that? That when we, if we were to look at the face of God, you would not see like a sternness because he's aggravated. You would see God's face shining upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Would you please stand and pray with me. Our good and gracious heavenly father, Lord, I thank you so much that you, you did not come to do away with the law, but you fulfilled the law. So Jesus, you never stole. In fact, not only did you not steal from us or from God, but you gave yourself to us. And God, you never lied because you are truth and you came full of truth and grace. And God, you, you, you never coveted, you never looked at us and wanted from us. God, you only want for us. And that Christ, the fulfillment of the law, went to the cross, paid our debt so that we could be fulfilled in you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would stir in our hearts so that we would not walk out of this place and, and try harder. But in Christ, we would find true contentment in you. And because of that, God, because of our contentment in you and in you alone, because of our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the love of a heavenly Father, and because of the empowerment of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, that our lives would reflect what has happened at the cross of Jesus, that it is finished. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we respond. Worship is response to who God is and what he has done. And so we're going to respond by singing. We're going to respond by coming to the altars and praying. And we're going to respond by bringing our first and best, our tithes and offerings, either electronically on the app or the giving kiosk or one of the boxes around the room, however you need to respond. Let's do so.